Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to come back. I have to say it's probably the second most beautiful campus after the University of Melbourne, of course, but um, it's very beautiful, very beautiful, and it's a great, great honour to be here to uh, celebrate what is a great, great um, lecture series that's been established. Um, so I am going to talk about dragons. I have been working on them for a while, and really what we might begin with is just some background. Okay, so... When we think about Komodo dragons, we do know they live in Indonesia and they live out in the eastern islands in the Lesser Sundas, not so far away from Australia. You can see it's quite actually very, very close to the, sort of the Northern Territory and the Northwest Shelf. But what most people forget, really, despite their really large size, I mean in most places where they are weighing up to about 90 kilos and reaching about three metres in length, they have this incredibly restricted range distribution and really, the best way to look at that is to just see the scale up here. You can see there's about 20 kilometres on the bottom and 20 miles, depending on the units that you prefer to use. But these islands aren't particularly large. This island over here is Komodo, the quintessential favourite or famous island where dragons live. And you'll notice that it's only about 340 square kilometres. And really, if you add up all the area where Komodo dragons are currently found, you're really looking at a square of about 28 kilometres by about 28. So really like the probably greater Brisbane. So it's a really tiny area where these very large lizards are crammed into. Okay, so they don't have a lot of habitat to play with, but they've held on for a very long time. All right, now if you go out to these islands, and I encourage you to do so because they're starkly beautiful, they're really, really amazing places, there's a couple of things that you'll notice. Depending on the time of year you'll go, you'll get a very, very different experience. So if you go in, say, April, immediately after the wet season, the wet season is very similar to northern Australia, very contracted wet season, what you'll notice is you've got these sparkling, or sparkling green islands and what you should notice here is there's a couple of very distinct habitat types. There's these very rugged hills with all this savanna grassland. Okay, that's great for a lot of the prey that, that big dragons feed on. So the ungulates like the deer, the pig, and in certain areas, buffalo as well. But it's really this valley habitat that is very crucial for the dragons. Okay, that's where you get all the diversity, all the smaller prey that the smaller dragons leave. And most of the dragons spend most of their time sitting out in, in this forest. It's often very hot out on these peripheral savannas, so it's like a, a very strong barrier to movement for dragons. So they don't actually move around a lot. But if you go out there in six months' time, towards sort of October, November, and in the same way as you are in northern Australia, you can see that it's very, very dry. You basically get very, very little rainfall. And this places a lot of environmental constraints out on these habitats. So what's quite surprising is that this vegetation is very similar, it's very deciduous. You can see that the trees are actually losing a lot of the leaves, so it's very, very dry, very, very hot. Okay, but that's the type of environments that dragons live in. And of course, it's well east of the Wallace Line, so it has a very interesting mixture of animals out there. You can go out there and basically can see, you know, one of the last sort of, I guess, eastern distributions of the macaque, the long-tailed macaque, as you can see here. But for Australians, it's very comforting when you're out there because you get to see a lot of Australian related fauna as well. So we've got cockatoos, but we see a lot of other bird life that are really familiar to Australians, such as rainbow beaters, orange-footed scrub fowl. So it's a really nice confluence of, of this mixture of Australian and, and Asian fauna out there. A lot of people ask me, how do I get to work on wild Komodo dragons? Lots of people get to work on captive Komodo dragons. They're in many zoos in Europe and the US and in Australia as well. Um, so there is a lot of captive research, but the wild research had been really, really hard to do for obvious reasons. It's very remote, it's a long way away, and it's actually very, very challenging. But I would like to say that I really think that I received some really good kind of guidance through, through my professor as well as at the University of Queensland. I thought that it was a very valuable experience, so valuable that it didn't prepare me when I moved to the US. I went to the University of Oklahoma and I was lost basically because as soon as life throws a spanner in the works, when you come from University of Queensland, when things are actually going so well, it didn't really quite prepare me for the real world. So just remember, if you're doing your PhD and it's going really well, there's always more hurdles to jump, and that's the way that life is. So don't get too cocky, that's the basis of that. And while I was in Oklahoma, watching twisters come down and touch down on the ground, and I was sitting there dissecting away these fish, pulling out their brains and looking at different sort of brain sensors for regulation behaviour, I thought, I really don't like this. And I was really, really fortunate that I had applied for the San Diego Zoo the year before and got offered both these postdocs with these two institutions. And it was just by chance that they re advertised the position and I retook it. And as soon as I got that, I had to make up some very lame excuse to my 
postdoctoral advisor in the US and say, oh, look, oh, uh, my mum's got uh, diabetes, I've got to go. <laughs> no, I had to come up with something very, very elaborate. I just said I couldn't bear living there and it was just unfortunate. I only had one restaurant. Uh, <laughs> that's why I moved to Melbourne. But, um, so I was very fortunate and then the San Diego Zoo, they were going through this rapid expansion phase where basically they created these postdoctoral positions and the University of Queensland's actually had two alumni that have been recipient to these. Bill Ellis was another person who got to work on koalas but they were working on all these amazing animals around the world. There was Goliath frog, the world's largest frog that lives in Cameroon. They were working on the drill. They were working on golden snub-nosed monkeys. So they basically said here's five years of salary, five years of field work, logistics money, go and do what you can. All right, you come up with a project, we don't need to know, just make it look good when we put in the um, end of year sort of manuals. All right, so for five years we basically ran on San Diego Zoo funding but then we established our own sort of organisation which is now fully run by, by Indonesians, the Komodo Survival Program and that's how we do most of our work to this, this very day. So when we went out there, and I really am being serious now, I was very fortunate to have to wor work with very good kind of population ecologists at the University of Queensland and also within Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. So there were some very sort of evident questions that I took away from my experiences to take and apply to Komodo dragons as well. And so, well, that's bad, isn't it? Um, the first one was, we really didn't know anything about dragon populations. Were they stable? Were they declining? How much was rain restriction had been taken place? We didn't know anything about that at that stage. We really didn't know what were the major processes on those islands that were influencing their survival. You can imagine when you've got populations set across different islands and they're under very different selection pressures where different agents can be regulating populations, even though one island can be within five kilometres of another. So they can be very disparate sort of controlling mechanisms regulating populations. So we needed to try and isolate those and find out what those were about. And the other thing is that really a massive question is if you work in Indonesia, you work across this great archipelago, it's full of biodiversity, I mean there's a lot of endemism there, but endemism has been ger generated by all these islands, so that's the paradox of islands is that you know, they provide all these punctuated environments that create lots of biodiversity, but it doesn't particularly bode well potentially for how these animals will respond to environmental change. So we really need to start to look at traits in these animals that may lend themselves to us gauging whether they're adaptable under fluxing environmental change. And of course, you know, it's not all about the applied stuff, you just really want to learn about the biology of animals that are really, really fascinating and interesting. So that's always been a major tier of, of sort of evolution, or sorry, of, of, of our work. Okay, so I have to be really honest, most of our work could not have succeeded without having a really great team. I feel very, very fortunate that I had lots of local guides. Many of these were put through masters that have come to the University of Melbourne. They've gone back and they now run the Komodo Survival Program. But you really need very, very diverse skills. Okay? You need people that can get through bureaucracy in Indonesia. It's like running through wet cement every day when you try and get permits and stuff like that. So you need people that can get through that. And you need people that are really disciplined and have lots of perseverance and you need to be supported by local people on the ground to make sure that you can do it. And of course you always need someone that is completely eccentric like my friend Claudio who works at the University of Florence. We only let him out of the boat hold every three days. It's a little bit, it's a little bit wild. So what does field work look like? So remember when you're out there, there are no roads, you can't get basically any transport, you can't take helicopters, you can't drop anywhere, you just basically rock up in a boat and then you need to walk around in these valleys. Now these valleys that we work in vary in area from sort of 7 to 8 to, to 20 square kilometres, so it means a lot of walking and really a lot of our work is really working with traps. But when we wanted to think about working on these populations, we really needed to work across the different islands that Komodo dragons were persisting on in Komodo National Park. And there's really four current islands where populations still persist. There's a big and famous island of Komodo, about 340 square kilometres. We established four sites in these valleys, and the valleys that we chose all have sort of fairly representative, fairly good habitat where we would expect to get sea dragons. We also set up four sites on the second big island of Rincha, if you've been out to Komodo National Park, you've either been to this valley, Lo Liang, or down to this valley down here in Lo Bai, they're the major tourist hubs, but we work all over the islands. But most people didn't really know that there are these two really small islands, about 10 square kilometres, okay, where there are two populations of Komodo dragons found. There used to be a Komodo dragon population here till about 1980, but it was extirpated. 
So we also work on full res. So we have about 13 sites that we do now. We do annual monitoring of dragons where, and their ungulate prey, and I'll explain the methods that we use. But to really deliver on this sort of workload, it takes six to seven months of field work per year, and that's a lot, a lot of time. And it's been that way ever since we began. Um, the way that we really do stuff is that we're very interested in population dynamics, so we need to be able to use mark recapture methods. And so we trap pretty much exhaustively through those different sites that we work in across those islands for six months of the year to try and work out what's going on with the population ecology of these animals. So far we have about close to 1,200 animals that are marked. Basically we trap them, and I'll show you how these traps look in a minute. We, we chip them with these microtransponders, we release them, and then we recapture that. And we've been doing that for about 12 years across these different sites now, and then we can use that for our demographic analyses. We basically place those traps out of these fixed trapping grids, so we have that very consistent sort of design where we will go back every year and use those same sites, so we have this sort of a nice experimental design in each one of those 10 sites across those islands. We're also very interested in other levers that are likely to play with their population dynamics. So we do a lot of ungulate prey work. So we really work on water buffalo, pigs and the Timor deer. And we use two types of field methods, scat counts but also distance sampling to really get some assessment of the population abundances of, of those key prey. We also collect a lot of blood samples for corresponding genetic studies and they go to Crazy Claudio back in Chibinong in, in Java and he analyses them there and we're basically building that up as well. But this is what field work looks like for us. It's not very flash. Here's a boat, very akin to one of those boats that runs into Christmas Island every now and again. Probably has been used for it. Um, I shouldn't say that, but anyway, I have. Um, so we, we carry all these traps, and basically we, we ship these traps through small canoes. So you can really see that the environment is very, very stark. So this is on Komodo Island. You can see these very big rugged hills with lots of savannah, mangrove forest, then we need to take all our traps in. We don't have anything to carry them other than them ourselves, so we need to pick them up, carry one piece of trap, basically walk that into the forest, into those trapping grids that we've established at those different sites. We set them up. This is a fully completed Komodo dragon trap. It's about three metres long by about 50 centimetres wide. Um, so it takes a lot of time to sample each one of these sites because of logistics, but this is what we use. They're purpose-built for dragons and they work really effectively. Okay, every now and again we get bored and we go out and we lasso, you can see a nice male going for a bit of a walk. We try and catch any dragon around our traps as well and then we mark and tag them as I showed you before. We weigh them, we collect all these measurements and we get quite a lot of information. So if we just look very quickly in terms of the type of data that we're getting, well, we're getting a lot of demography data, we're getting abundant survival growth data across those sites. We're getting lots of estimates on prey variation that's available to dragons across those sites, both in space and time. And we're also building up our genetic database so that we can get in sort of various estimates that can help us understand about the dispersal and inbreeding coefficients that are likely to be important in terms of demographic processes influencing the population persistent. So I'm going to just talk about two aspects of dragon biology. One, I don't no longer find particularly interesting, but I did at the time. But it's a question that most people ask me, um, which is really, why are dragons so big? And we need to remember, they're not so big when they're born. They're only about 100 grams. And then basically what happens is that you get this very strong life history trajectory between males and females, where the males are growing very, very large, up to 90 kilograms. And the females are much, much smaller and petite, and growing up to about 25 to 30 kilograms. Okay. Um, so why... Many people ask me, why are dragons so big? Well, to really think about that, we just need to go and think about the general theory behind gigantism and dwarfism on, on islands. And really, the easiest way to explain why body size evolves, either larger or smaller, is really looking, when you make a comparison between the mainland and the island population, is that the island will differ. It will either be a more beneficial environment because something's relaxed in terms of competition or predation, or food availability may be higher, and that will often lead to gigantism. Conversely, as you can see in the case here, where we've got two examples of dwarfism. We've got the pygmy elephants and also the hobbits on Flores, so about 50 kilometres away from where we work. This is what it perhaps looked like about 30,000 years ago. You can actually go out to Bajawa in, in central Flores now and see some exquisite fossils of, of pygmy elephants, which is in central Flores. Really amazing. Um, so presumably these guys on these islands are under a lot of kind of competition 
for resources or food availability generally compared to larger islands is harsh, so they tend to evolve to be smaller. All right. But what we're really dealing with is, is animal populations distributed across islands. And if you begin to look at that, then you begin to need to add in additional factors that are influencing body size. And we need to think about male competition through sexual selection and also what type of life history females are opting to use. So whether they're under very strong fecundity selection, you might get them delaying sexual maturity to be very, very large, like female sea turtles, which tend to be bigger than, than male sea turtles because they're under very strong fecundity selection. So you'll see these processes acting out across islands in different sort of combinations, and that begins to influence body size variation in dragons. And what we know, if we go across those 10 sites, is that we see quite a staggering amount of maximum size variation among, among individuals. And really, what I'm reporting here on the graph on the left, sorry, is simply the relationship of a site and it's maximum body size for dragons found. So what you can see is that really the dragons on these small islands are dwarfs. They're very, very small. They're only about... I'll get the hang of it one day. <laughs> a very small, less than 20 kilograms. But then when you go to the sites on the very, very large islands, you can begin to see that those animals are, are, are much, much larger, nearly four and a half times heavier in terms of their maximum body size. And if you do a very simple correlation between the food availability to those animals at those different sizes and relate that to dragon body mass, then you can see there's a nice positive relationship. So it looks like at some level, across those different sites, food is either limiting or enabling dragons to vary quite considerably in body size. But that's really only part of the story. And, and for that, to really understand why male dragons are so much larger than females, we need to really think about their life history differences between the sexes, and I'll talk a bit about that now. All right, so one of the nice things about from all that mark recapture data we get is we get a lot of growth data. We recapture individuals across time, over 10 years, across those 10 sites, and you begin to build up these great growth profiles. So we know how long it takes Komodo dragon to basically reach, reach its size. And what we notice is that males and females have very different strategies of growth for very, very different reasons. So the main thing to notice is that males are growing very, very rapidly. They're decreasing in their growth rate quite slowly. And obviously what they're trying to do, they're trying to get as big as possible as fast as possible. Okay? And that's what they do, and they attain a much larger body size. But the females are doing something very different. What they're really showing here is that they're trying to reproduce at a fairly small size. They're growing very, very slowly. Their growth rates decelerate very fast, which is a classic trade-off, basically suggesting that they're then moving resources or energy into their reproductive investment. All right, but the other interesting thing about this thing is that it leads to these prodigious life history differences between males and females. Males are growing very, very fast, but they're also growing for a very, very long time. And when we try and basically back-calculate these growth rates into age at growth, then we find the males are really taking a very, very long time to reach those very large body sizes. So they're sort of asymptoping as their growth rate slows right down, but it's looking like they're probably getting up to about 70 years old out in the wild in some cases. So they're living for a very long time. But the females are very, very different. The females are basically stopping or basically based on their growth rates because they're still positive, are probably only living to about 28 years of age. Okay. So there's this fundamental life history difference in the way that they, they're utilising the, their growth. And there's for very obvious reasons, if you think about it. Basically what's going on here, females are really investing a lot more energy into reproduction. They build these colossal nests, you can see here. This is a, a nest that they've converted from a megapode mound. What the female will do, she will spend about a month excavating this nest. She'll build all these dummy chambers in there. She will lay her eggs into one of those chambers. Then she will nest guard, not to the same extent as crocodiles, but she will nest guard for about five or six months. She really reduces her feeding rate during that time. And by the time that they leave that nest, after constructing it, they're very emaciated. Okay? And we think that investment in that nesting phase is having a major energetic cost on their life history and really curtailing their life expectancy. So if you're getting a really big curtailing in life expectancy on females, then something obviously is going to happen, is that you're going to end up with a very biased sex ratio as males grow, continue to grow through time. And what we can see here is females drop out of the system effectively. They drop out about here. They're no longer living past this, this size. And we're ending up with these masses of males present in the system. So there's this incredibly skewed male biosex ratio 
for most adult Komodo dragon populations. And the obvious repercussion for that is to really think about what it means for these guys. Well, if sex ratio is very skewed and you need to basically have reproductive success, then you're probably going to have to fight very, very hard. And one of the best ways of winning contests and fights is obviously to grow big and be stronger and larger than your rival males. So that may be a very strong selective force in these animals to generate the very large body sizes that we, we take. Okay, so that's a very general question a lot of people ask me, but a question that I'm very interested in is what do dragons do? So if we all imagine our favourite animal, we can imagine it, we're in the forest and we're watching whatever it is, I'm imagining a little snail right now sliding down a tree, and I want to know what it does. And suddenly, the best way to do that is to take it out of the system. What happens to the environment when you take it out of the system? Okay, does the environment change very much? Does it do anything? Or does the environment just basically go cactus? So what do dragons do? And we can try and think of them, assigning them to a type of chess piece. So we've got some chess pieces here. We know pawns. If you lose a pawn very early in the game, the functionality or the complexity of the game will not really change all that much. If you lose your queen very early in the game, then the functionality and the complexity of the game changes disproportionately much, much more than losing a pawn. So what we're really trying to work out here is really what is the ecological role, the functional role of Komodo dragons in the environment. We know in many kind of mammalian studies and also when you've got ectotherms eating ectotherms, so say for example sharks eating rays or something like that and you lose them from overexploitation or through uh, hunting and poaching in many cases for many of these predators and you get prodigious trophic cascade changes. But does that happen also with large ectotherms that are actually e eating mammalian? It's actually a very unusual, uncoupled kind of predator-prey dynamic and there aren't many examples of it. Really, I mean, there's white sharks and seals, but we really don't know. So if we take Komodo dragons out of the system, and we might think about this from a conservation perspective, if we lose Komodo dragons from, from those islands, what happens to the environment out there? Um, you know, if you were very mammal-centric, you'd say straight away that you'd probably get, you know, a trophic cascade shift or a regime shift or something like that. But it doesn't have to happen. We know lots of systems can be bottom-up driven, that they're driven by resources rather than top-down regulation from their predators. And so, you know, it's quite plausible that dragons could simply eat the doomed surface you know, of, of their prey. There are enough animals dropping dead because they're diseased or in poor state that that could simply maintain Komodo dragon populations without Komodo dragons having any function on their prey what to speak of. Or conversely, they may be somewhere further down that continuum where they basically do have some ecological function where they are actually regulating their prey. And if they're regulating their prey, then basically if you decrease the amount of deer, for example, then you're going to change things to shrubs, the composition of your herbs, even the soil nutrients, the, the, you know, the, the microbe composition that's going underground as well. All these things will follow in turn. We just don't know. So we've been trying to get a handle on this, and it's very hard to do. We can't manipulate our systems. We can't go in there and take out dragons off an island. But what we can do, look, and we, I've got two examples that kind of suggest that they may have some sort of top-down regulation, is to look at that recently extirpated island, measure deer on it, basically plot the deer abundance on an island where there are no longer any dragons, they were extirpated about 20 years ago, compare that to islands of the same magnitude of, or area that have deer, and what we notice from this very simple, and I'm not going to write wax lyrical about this because it's a single replicate, but it does suggest that in the absence of dragons on these small islands that you can also <laughs> get higher levels of deer than you would predict from, from the relationship below. So that's some correlative evidence. More importantly, we can try and do what a lot of people do. is when you basically There's two ways of measuring predator-prey dynamics. You can sort of do the, the classic temporal dynamics where predator and prey oscillate in kind of synchronous but time lag functions, or you can look at this spatial variation as well where you can start to look to predator-prey ratios, and this gets used a lot as well. People have some problems with it, but it goes into fashion and comes out of fashion like lots of theories and, and, and things in science. But what you might expect is that if we go out to the, all those sites that we measure both dragon population abundance but also that prey abundance, and we can basically look at the natural variation between dragons in terms of their abundance against their prey. And what we might expect is that as dragon abundance increases relative to their prey, then we should expect prey to decrease if they're having some trophic capacity or some predatory role in regulating this thing. And what we find 
when we look at those relationships is that we do tend to get these very strong relationships. I'm not going to take this home. I'm not going to say that Komodo dragons are, are the next thing to slide spread, but it's quite interesting. This is the first bit of evidence, even though it's correlative, suggesting that they may have some ecological function. And that's not bad for a big lizard. All right, so I want to move right along a little bit and start talking about some monitoring and conservation because really that's the bread and butter of, of, of what we do when we're out there. We like to look at those other things, but we really need to concentrate on this stuff. So what can I tell you about the populations that we've been following through time? Well, I can tell you that basically the big island populations appear to be quite stable. They seem to be you know, basically not decreasing very much. If you look at their population growth rates, they're all about one, they're all about stable. We have noticed that on those two small islands over here, both about 10 square kilometres each, that there has been a decline over the time of our studies. Okay? So I have mixed emotions about this. I mean, I feel like, well, it's great that the two big islands are stable because at the end of the day, that's where the bulk of the population is going to be. So any perturbation or any disturbance, you would much prefer it to happen to your small islands, even if they go extinct. So I, I kind of feel comfortable about that. And I, I won't have time to talk about what we can do about that, but one of the big questions that I've always been asked is how many dragons are there? You know, there's kinds of like, you know, how many dra dragons are there? You know, how many animals do you have in a patch of forest? How many of this? It seems to be like this endless question, but it's actually, despite its simplicity, it takes an extraordinary amount of effort and work to try and work out. And we've tried to do it for dragons across those sites that we work. And what we've done is basically try to estimate the total number of dragons in Komodo National Park, which is really representing about 80% of the total geographic distribution of this species. Uh, and what we notice is that, again, as you might expect, is that those small islands have very small island populations, okay? Less than 100 individuals, very, very tiny. And we know in the case of this island that it's really been isolated for a very, very long time, you know, probably about 10,000 years, okay? Komodo has been isolated for about 80,000 years, so these populations are quite independent, all right? But the total population size of dragons running around about Komodo National Park, when we average all our density estimates across time, is about 3,000 individuals, okay? That's what we're playing with. If we add the other 20% of the available habitat outside that, then maybe, maybe there's 4,000 at, at a top estimate, but that's probably somewhere around the total number of Komodo dragons averaged over the last 10 years of field work that we've done that's in existence at the moment. So it's not massive, but it's not small either. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about dragons and environmental change. Okay, so we've seen a lot of environmental change. You can imagine Indonesia with an incredible population growth rate that it takes place before your very eyes. The jump off port up here in Labuan Bajo, so if you've been to Komodo National Park, you would have gone through Labuan Bajo. When I first started working there, it was probably about 8,000 people. Ten years later, there's about 40,000 people, and it's just this bustling little metropolis. Okay, that's the level of sort of population growth you're getting. It's exorbitant. Now, what's quite interesting is that really why Komodo dragons have done so well generally in Komodo National Park is not an advent of protection so much. It's really about the human culture that is in association with it. Out in the National Park, what we find is that you've got maritime people. These are the Bajo people. Okay, and what they do, their livelihoods are based on fishing. So they don't care about terrestrial resources. They don't go into the forest and chop it down. They're not burning it. They're not trying to graze their, their, their herds or stocks of buffalo through there. So this area seems to be naturally protected. But if you go on to Flores, then you've got a different ethnic group of people, the Mungarai people, who are you know, great agrarian people, great kind of farmers. They've been basically agro-farming that place for about 10,000 years. It's quite amazing. And you walk into these forests and there's... You know, there's coffee and there's chocolate and there's salak palms and it looks like a wild forest, but it's all, all human edible plants. But it looks like a forest. It's really, really amazing. You can see it in Bali too if you go out the back. But that prodigious land rate for agriculture and forestry is really carving up the available habitat left. No one can really work up in the high altitudes. It's 3,000 metres. It's a very steep mountain range. It's very hard to successfully use agriculture in those types of environments. So a lot of the coastal flatlands has been prioritised to basically allow continued human expansion and that's really ripping into to Komodo habitat. So we've seen that already happen at a local scale. We've seen these local anthropogenic changes influencing the range distribution and making it smaller over the last 20 years. But it doesn't really tell us about what climate change will do. And really, with these islands, what we need to really worry about is, and the problem is that this is... A, 
Indonesia, like northern Australia, is really under a very different climatic driver from most other places. So it has to deal with El Nino. And El Nino is very hard to predict. If you look at the climate modelling for El Nino, it's way behind all the other major climate cycles that have been predicted by physicists and meteorologists in terms of what's going to happen. So it's very hard. We don't know what way it's going to go. Is there going to be increased rainfall? Is there going to be decreased rainfall? We don't know for this part of Indonesia. But whatever the change is, it will have a major, major effect on habitats. I mean, the, the obvious thing about this is that you've got this stark ecotone, okay? So you've basically got these valleys where it's nice and green and you've got this brown savanna grasslands on the outside. So if there's less rainfall, grass is going to love it. They will just rip through and invade basically these valleys because there won't be enough water moisture to maintain these forests. Conversely, if we get much more rainfall, then we might have an expansion of habitat. We might, and we've seen that. We've seen that in the wet tropics. You know, we've seen rainforests actually grow in the advent of lots of fire regimes for, from Aborigines over the last sort of 100 years. It's one of the few places where rainforest is expanding okay, through changed fire regimes. But whatever way it goes, we'll have very dire implications for their life history of, of Komodo dragons. If it gets dry, basically that's great for their deer. Okay? But if you start to get degraded forests that's much more open, then you lose all the diversity of prey that small dragons need. Okay? So it puts a real constraint on survival of the small dragons. Also, opening up the environment, it's a lot less shade. Maybe that'll put a much greater constraint on thermal reg regulation and activity time for those animals, making it much, much harder. Conversely, if it gets wetter, then we'll see expansion of forest, and that's great for the little dragons, but it declines the prey because savanna grassland, the pasture availability is decreasing, and that will influence the adults. So it hits different parts of the population in different ways. And whatever that habitat change is, it will lead to demographic and genetic change for those populations through time. So if we're going to understand environmental change for dragons, at least from an empirical perspective, from, from a, what we can actually do about it now, try and identify those things without predicting consequences in the absence of not knowing how environment is currently influencing these animals, then we need to go and measure a few things. We need to be able to measure demographic performance under kind of different environmental conditions. The nice thing about working on islands is you may not always have, you know, those long track records called, sorry, the long durations of time, but you've got beautiful spatial variation. There's very stark differences in environment, okay? So we can go and try and do that. But the other thing is we need to look at adaptability and key traits. All animals possess traits. Traits can be flexible, they can evolve. But knowing whether they can or can't under sort of environmental conditions that are present or current through natural variation is also very insightful to sort of beginning to understand the limits and constraints on adaptability of animals. All right, so we know across these islands from our research that they obviously vary in habitat quality quite a lot. You know, you've got islands that are very, very dominated by savanna. Some are, don't have any kind of rainforest. There's major differences in prey availability. There's major differences in density. Most populations are density regulated to some extent. So there's lots of differences in competition for resources. And there's also lots of different variation in breeding. You know, inbreeding arises through isolation, but it can also arise when you're dealing with small valley populations through monopolization as well. So you're basically getting all these different forces or factors at play out there, but which is most important? Well, when we go out there, again, it seems like prey steals the show. If you basically look at the relationship between survival across those sites, then it always seems that survival is being basically regulated by, by prey availability. Okay? So we can see that on the big islands where we have higher prey availability, that survival is generally better than those small populations. And we remember that because we saw those declines in those small populations. So that sort of fits. But how do we fix that? Well, one way would be to fix it by, you know, perhaps augmenting food, perhaps, or not. But we also need to think about secondary factors. And the main thing to notice about these two islands is they have very different sort of genetic signatures. This island over here is basically very, very outbred. Okay, so it really doesn't have any genetic issues. Whereas this one indicates quite a lot of inbreeding. So it's not always one factor. So we know we're beginning to get a handle on what are the major forces across the spatial variation of dragons that's influencing some of their population vital rates. All right, in the last kind of thing, if we're going to really think about response to environmental change, can dragons actually do anything about it? Do they have the capacity to basically move to better environments? We both, we hear a lot about phenology where animals make different choices in their timing of events to get and coordinate their activities with better environments at different times of the year. But dispersal remains probably the most prodigious kind of 
trait that most animals can exploit to move into different environments to try and counteract environmental change. But how well do dragons disperse? Those mechanisms that I just showed you that explain survival across those different populations are potent selection forces on dispersal of most animal populations. Okay? So if a dragon is in a bad environment, will it do anything about it? Will it get up and go, right, bugger it, I've had enough of this. I'll go somewhere where it's lush, nice, and much, much happier and more beneficial to my life. But in consideration of the decision, the animal has to basically be aware of a couple of things. It has to be aware of the benefits, that it might be better somewhere else, but it also has to be aware of the costs. And dispersal has a lot of costs. It has energetic costs, it has a transition cost. You can imagine if you're a dragon and you swim across the ocean and you get picked up in an eight-knot current, then you get swept out to sea. There's no way you're going to make landfall. Okay, so there's navigation costs, but there's also the obvious cost that when you live in the island systems, you rock up onto a completely different island. Okay? It's a little bit like us rocking up into the Bronx or something like that. You, know, you rock up into this completely different environment, you're very unfamiliar with it, or think of whatever example that, that you want to use. It's a very, very difficult environment, or very foreign to you. Will you do very well? Okay? And this is what we've really been asking. And that was one of the major things that we started out with. So for 10 years, we've been basically marking all these dragons, and we've had about 3,000 recaptures. And you know how many animals have moved site, despite all that spatial variation in all those environmental things? Does anyone want to guess? Zero? Uh, uh, no. Come on. <laughs> Try a little hard. I know it's Queensland, but be a bit more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the 2,500 recaptures, we've had two animals move. Okay. <laughs> all right. Two, and they've moved only about three or four kilometres. And that's you know, across all the sources of variance that you can think about in terms of dispersal. And what's quite ironic about that lack of dispersal is that it's not that dragons aren't very mobile. They're incredibly mobile. Okay. If you have a look up here, we put GPS trackers. We've actually telemetered everything from hatchlings all the way through to adults. And they're one of the most agile, well not agile, but mobile lizards. You can see here, as they go through ontogeny from, from hatchlings through to large adults, that their rates of valley movements are changing quite a lot. And that's really reflecting their change in foraging habits, but it's also suggesting when they need to, they can certainly move, but they don't. What they do is they really have this extraordinary sense of sight fidelity. Okay? So there seems to be this major constraint on movement. And I can think of lots of good reasons why you wouldn't want to move to be a dragon, even when your local environment is worse. Okay? The problem with the islands, at least the way that they're set up, they're not far away. I could swim between the islands. Some islands are only about a kilometre apart. Other islands are only four or five kilometres apart. It's warm water. It's 30 degrees. There are currents there. But it's not a major matrix constraint, not a major dispersal barrier for these animals. I, what I basically think is that if you are a big dragon, where you're very, very large, and you end up turning up on a small island where you're basically food limited, then basically your chances of surviving on that island are very, very poor. And the thing about those islands, even though they vary in time, because of that great spatial difference, those selection forces are likely to be remarkably consistent across time. Okay, so you can imagine that it's very strong selection against dispersal, and hence why you always hear about you know, flightless birds and things like that. There's very strong dispersal costs in island animals, which is not a no-brainer, but I just thought I'd talk to you about it. The other thing is that um, why haven't there been more movements within islands? You know, it's not that far. You know, it's only a kilometre over the hill. You could do that in you know, a couple of hours or something like that. There might be much more deer over in one valley than another valley. Why not move? Perhaps it just comes down to this, and I'm just kind of going to make up some nice sweet little white lies here. It comes down to their sort of social geography. If you basically are foreign to a populace of, of very large, potentially aggressive animals, and you move in there and you don't know where they are, then you're basically walking into a, a landmine field. Okay? And I love this photo. This was taken by Cyril Russo. Does anyone know what it is? It's delicious. It's uh, dragon jerky. Uh, this is basically an ex example of cannibalism. Okay? So you can see that it's swallowing the, the foot of another dragon. And so I can imagine that when these dragons, well, I'm going to embellish this, I can imagine, when they go over these valleys, they don't know where other large males are. If you're a small individual or another large individual, you're walking into these ranges of, of large aggressive animals that could potentially do a, a lot of damage. And that may even in itself be enough kind of, of a deterrent to stop a lot of local dispersal operating. And I'm just going to sort of finish off because I think I have about five minutes left. Um, 
In the last few years, I mean, we've done a lot of this monitoring. We've raced around carrying traps everywhere and we've sort of looked at the population stuff. But, you know, I would be quite honest to say that the level of conservation required in the park is, is nothing compared to Flores. So Flores for us remains a big challenge on how we will conserve Komodo dragons. What can we actually do out there? And Flores, as I've sort of alluded to already, is basically decreasing habitat availability for Komodos. Okay, at, at the moment, really what we have is three reserves that are left on Flores. Okay, we've got one at Poda, one out at Riung, and one down here at Waywall. They're about 20 square kilometres, not very much land. But that's all that's left, really, of the remaining safeguarded habitat around Flores. But the problem with those reserves is that they're getting increasingly ensconced by villages, by activities of humans, and you can see some of these are pretty much on the borders of all these reserves already. There's rice agriculture, so there's these landscape barriers. There's increased fire, fire regimes that are going on. A lot of villages, particularly on the coast here, will basically light up the pasture every year because it improves the past productivity for their domesticated stock. There's feral animals through all these parks, both in terms of ungulates, but also dogs. A lot of the dogs from, from the villages go rife running through basically these parks and will kill prey for, for, for dragons as well. Actually, the last time that we were at it in, in, in Waywell, we actually caught more dogs than dragons. I think the ratio was about three to one dogs. Um, so we caught about, I think, 30 dogs and, and, and 10 dragons. So they're having a bit of an effect as well. And you really need to understand, and I, I don't know if you get this, you know, people have very different values on, on national parks. We, typically as Westerners, have a very strong aesthetic sense about national parks. You look at it and you think, you think about awe and wonderment, you might have some spirituality attached to it. But if you're a dirt poor villager, that's the last thing you think about. It just looks like a, you know, a stacked fridge full of goodies. All right, so around these reserves are all these villages. It's a bit hard to see here, but these little orange blots. There are all these villages and they're beginning to manipulate and exert their influence on these reserve boundaries, okay? So what can we do about that? Well, what we can do is try and make sure that the National Park is doing their job by maintaining a presence. They do need to use security, and I hate to say that, but that you actually do need some force of security, and education is vital. So we've been working on these types of things, and this is really what we do. We've been funding increased ranger patrols. We've built new ranger stations. We've basically tried to demark the boundaries around those reserves so that people actually know where the limits of, of their land and, and the park begins. And obviously trying to get kids when they're young and when they're kind of a bit more kind of receptive to, to knowing about these things is also important. And obviously we have a lot more serious meetings than, than working with school children as well, with religious leaders and, and civil leaders as well, to try and get them to begin to, to value those reserves. So I'd like to keep working on them. I don't know if I have as much time as I used to, but I still think there's a lot to be learnt. And um, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not optimistic about about the future for many endemics in Indonesia. I'm not. I mean, if you go over there and you spend a decade there, you can see how much can go on. But you know, we would like to try and do what we can to sort of stem, I guess, the tide of change that is operating on those animals, particularly in Flores, and see what that happens. And I'm going to stop there. I'd like to thank the various sponsors that have helped us throughout the years and the people who provided these photos. Thank you very much.